today we're going to sing about that. Stand to your feet, please.
you are alive. And we stand across this room and we testify to that truth. And Lord, this morning, I just pray that, that this future hope and eternal glory with you in heaven for all eternity would weigh heavy on our hearts. And that the circumstances of this world and the trials and the tribulations would just help us press into you even more. Let's sing. I have this hope as an anchor for my soul.
Well, welcome those of you who are joining us online, and uh, this is the concluding message of our study of the book of Malachi, so uh, this is the one that you wanted to hear. It's, uh, it's been a heavy book to study, and so you certainly want to be here for this last message as we get to certainly a vision of hope. But before we look at our, the Word of God and study it together, we want to continue to worship the Lord through a time of prayer together, asking God to speak to our hearts, also praying for one another during this time, praying for ourselves, and I know there are many needs out there, so would you join with me as we go to the Lord for this time of prayer? Father, we, uh, we do bless your name and we praise you for you are good and you are great and you are mighty. How majestic is your name, O oh Lord. We, we honor you today. Lord, we bow before you, acknowledging that we are very low and you are very high. And Lord, we thank you that you are able and that you are willing to, uh, to reach down, that your arm is not so short that it cannot save and that you would save the least of these. You would save us who are lost sinners. And Lord, we pray for those who are watching online, those who are in the room today, those who will be watching maybe later on, on TV or some device, that, that Lord, that you would save the lost, that they would know of your greatness and the salvation that you are mighty to save. And Lord, we thank you that our salvation is certainly reserved in heaven forever, but it is a present salvation also that you provide for us. And we thank you for the very presence of God in our life. Thank you that you have promised that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And so, Father, we come to you acknowledging that we desperately need you, and we pray that your hand would, would be upon us and that you would meet our needs. Our, our needs are many, and they are varied, Lord, uh, we we need you to touch our bodies because uh, we live in a, in a broken body in so many ways. And we pray for healing, especially for those who are sick among us. And Father, we pray for emotional healing and mental health among our faith family. Lord, that you would, uh, you would restore what may be uh, the, the, the culture and the, the enemy has taken away from us. That we would be encouraged today. That the joy of the Lord will be our strength today, that in your presence is fullness of joy. And Lord, we pray that you would restore our relationships. And in just a minute, we pray that you would restore the hearts of the fathers to their children, the children to their fathers. And, and Lord, we, we pray for, continue to pray for the situation in the Ukraine. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and all of those surrounding countries, those who are in the Ukraine, many who are fleeing and we thank you for the sin relief efforts and other efforts that are, that are underway to, to minister to those who have become refugees. We pray, God, for uh, just healing and we pray for a resolution. We pray that people would know that Jesus is Lord in that part of the world. And Lord, uh, we, we stand in the gap and we far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you as Samuel said, and so Lord, we say that, Lord, that we want to pray and we want to stand in the gap. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for those who've returned from being on mission this past week and what you've done in their life and what you've done in the lives of people that they ministered to. Thank you for opportunities that you have provided for us to, to go and make disciples locally and also globally, and, and we certainly continue to pray for the work and our, our Olive Street campus, and we are excited about what you're going to do there. And, and Lord, we pray that you'd speak to us today. I have no doubt that I know in my own heart, my own life, I need a, a renewed vision of hope, and certainly that would be the case for all of us here. And we thank you for your, the Word of God that is true and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And God, we pray that you'd give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say, anoint the preacher today, and help him to preach the truth of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, if you've got your Bible, go ahead and open it to the book of Malachi. We're going to be in, there's only six verses in chapter four, but we're going to look at a few verses in chapter three as we look at this paragraph together. And, and what we see is this prophetic word of God ends that there is a promise of a coming day, a promise of a rising sun and a promise of a restoring prophet. But ultimately, all of those we see is really fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, and our hope is in a coming king. 
and that Jesus is coming back one day. And that's what Malachi is really looking ahead to. And yet it's out of a context that we have uh, established uh, in our, our series. We, we've seen that he is speaking to a people who have come out of revival experience, out of the revival of Ezra and Nehemiah. And yet that revival had waned and uh, they had lost their zeal and they had become disobedient. And the stage was set where God says to them first in chapter 1, I have loved you. And God wants us to know that he's lo- he loves us. God loves us. And that is his message. And he loves us so much that he's not going to let us stay in the mess that we find ourselves in. And so he corrected them. He gave them instruction. First of all, he corrected the compromised and corrupt spiritual leadership of that day. And he also pointed out that their unfaithfulness to God in their unequally yoked marriages and their divorces, and then they, they were not faithful to God in giving, and they were robbing God of his tithes and his offerings. And yet in the midst of all of that, he's created pathways of repentance along the way. And then we get to the conclusion of this book. It concludes on such a high note, on such a, a good note of hope. And you see, that's really what we live for is hope. The the Bible tells us in the book of Colossians that Christ in you is the hope of glory and that, that Jesus Christ, the return of Christ is seen as the blessed hope. And so today we want to cast a vision of hope. And we're going to read verses 1 through 6. We'll back up and pick up a few of these verses in in chapter 3 here in just a moment. But I want to invite you to stand with me, if you would, and honor the Lord as we read Malachi chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And it says, "For, For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff." And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Father, thank you for your word that is true and powerful, always accomplishing its purposes, never returning void. We pray that would be the case for us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. As we back up just a few verses and we look into chapter 3, we're going to see coming out of, again, the accusations that God makes against a sinful people. And the heart of the problem is always the problem of the heart. And while the people of Israel that we've been looking at in this particular time, just preceding the the intertestamental period, that 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, that we we see the problem and and the sin of the day that I've already mentioned And yet in the midst of that, we see the providential hand of God in preserving his people. That God is going to preserve. He he says in chapter 3 that he is the Lord that does not change. And because he does not change, he's going to keep his covenant with the sons of Jacob is what he says. And that is hope that the fact that if, if you have been saved by the grace of God, God will keep you. God will not abandon you. God will not forsake you. Yes, God disciplines those whom he loves, but he loves them with an everlasting kind of love. So it is a message of hope. And the hope for the problem is a coming day. It is a rising sun. It is a restoring prophet. But ultimately, no, ultimately we know that the hope that we have is in the coming king, the king of kings. Let's back up to verse 13 and 
And let's look at these verses real quickly. We see that the problem of the heart is exposed as the people continue to, to complain. They, first of all, they question God's accusation of arrogant words. Look at verse 13. It says, Your words have been arrogant against me, says the Lord, yet you say, what have we spoken against you? We see this repeated behavior again, that God makes a statement and they question that statement. And so they're doing that again, and they're making that statement about their arrogance, and in particular, their arrogant words, that the, the way they talk and the way they communicate about God and, 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 and to others are arrogant words. And it's a very easy thing because you see our pride manifests itself in our arrogance. And so God makes that statement and he goes on further and, and we see that they question the value of worshiping and serving God. Look at verse 14. You have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his charge, that we have walked in, in mourning before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they also test God and escape. And so they become very cynical in their approach to worshiping God. And listen, I'm telling you, this world is filled with people who are questioning the value of worshiping God. There are people today, and there was a trend going on before COVID ever came. And it was a trend that people were not going to church as much as they used to. Uh, it, and people weren't going as often. I, I, I have often made the comment, you know, it's been a long time since we gave away any perfect attendance pins. Uh, some of you are old enough that you can remember those days that somebody would actually go to Sunday school and church the entire year without missing a single service, and they'd get a, they'd get a perfect attendance pin. Now, I know some of y'all believe I'm just making that up and nobody's ever done that, but actually that, they, that actually used to happen. But, but that trend trend has been, been going and it's been accelerating through the years and, and all that. But, but now, when COVID hit, it certainly, uh, everything started over. And, and everything I'm reading, and I read a lot of stuff out there and what everybody thinks is going to happen and all those kinds of things. I hope I'm reading the Bible more than I'm reading some of these other things. But, but certainly the trend is, and the, the question is, I'm seeing it frequently, are, are they coming back? You know, who's coming back? And, and the conclusion is that many, many people are not coming back. They're not coming back. And you, you say, well, why would that be? Well, there, there's probably a lot of reasons. But really the heart of it is found, I think, right here in that they have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his charge and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts. It, 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 what, what benefit is it? And you see, a lot of times, we approach worship with, okay, man, what am I going to get out of it? And listen, believe me, I, I assume a lot of responsibility, and we pray and, and, and that, that God, that nobody would ever come and say, man, I got absolutely nothing out of that gathering. I, mean, it, it, I take it very seriously. I know people drive a long way. They spend money to come. And so from my perspective and our perspective, we want, to, we want you to meet with God. We want you to hear a word from God. We want you to be glad that you came. But you know, there's another side of this. And the other side is that, my friend, we should gather and worship because God tells us to. I mean, that, we should obey God. It shouldn't be, it, it, and, and as I read just a few moments ago from the book of Acts, as, as the church at Antioch were gathering, you know what it said, what I read just a minute, did you notice? It says, as they were ministering to the Lord. Did you notice that? As they were ministering to the Lord. In their worship, they were ministering to God. So, see, our gathered worship is not just what we get, but it's also what we give back to God in worship, in adoration, and glory that goes to Him. And here, these people, they just, they just did not see the value of it. They questioned, well, is, it, it's vain for us to worship. It, it, what do we get out of it? What benefit is there to us gathering in worship. Well, I'll tell you what, my friend, if you know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior and, he, and the Holy Spirit lives within you, gathered worship with other believers is a lifeblood. It is, it is a necessity. It is something that fills your life. 
How many times, I, I made the statement, I've hugged more senior adult men uh, than I ever have in any seri- time in my life. When, when people started coming back to worship, I know the first time I sat here, I just wept and people wept all over this place as they came back for worship. Because why? Because it is essential. It is not vain. It is not a waste of time. And those who do not see the necessity and the importance of biblical gathered worship find themselves in the same category as these people in Malachi. They question the value of worshiping and serving God. Folks, I want you to know this world is filled with people like that. And and as, as the time winds down, God is shaking things up. And the shaking of things up are going to shake some people loose. But I want you to know those who are saved by the grace of God have the promise and the providential hand of God that he will never leave you, he will never forsake you, he will hold on to you. And then the second thing I want you to see is really verses 16 to the end of the chapter 4, and that is the promise of hope is exclaimed. We see the problem of the heart is exposed, but also the promise of hope is exclaimed. In chapter 3, verse 2, we, we see that Malachi is anticipating the coming of the messenger, the coming of Christ. And this is exactly what he's anticipating here. And, and, and here we see that God promises to distinguish those who fear him. Verse 16 of chapter 3 says this, Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. And the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. And they will be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I prepare my own possession, I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And so we'll again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. And so he goes from talking about those who who deny God's accusation of arrogant words and those who who do not see the importance of, of gathering to worship and serving God. They are cynical about that. And he identifies them as the wicked, those who do not fear God. But then he also takes notice of those who do fear God. And he will distinguish, it says, between the righteous and the wicked. I, I say he will distinguish the righteous and he will ex- extinguish the wicked. And then God not only is promising to distinguish those who fear him, but it will, God also promises a coming day. Look in verse 1, he says there in, in chapter 4, he says, For behold, the day is coming. It will be a day, he goes on to say, of burning judgment. In verse 1, continuing, it says, Burning like a fire. This day will be burning like a furnace. And all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And he just talked about the arrogant just a few moments ago. Well, they will be like chaff. And chaff is the, is the waste of when you, you do a, a, a harvest. And, and it is just, just the, 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 the light stuff just burns up. I mean, it's just wasted shells and hulls of, of grain is what it is. There's no grain to it. And the day is coming. It will set them ablaze in the Lord of hosts that it will leave them neither root nor branch and it will be all-consuming. A day is coming of judgment. And this last chapter of the book of Malachi is much like the last chapter of the book of the Revelation. It speaks of a burning judgment, the judgment of God that is coming. And he will make a distinction uh, between those who are righteous and those who are wicked in that day. It will also be a day of brilliant sun rising. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. What a, a, a beautiful and yet unusual statement is made here. I want us to, to walk through that just for a moment. First of all, it, we see that it is the, the sun the sun, S-U-N, but really it is pointing to the sun, S-O-N, is what he, he's pointing to. But there will be a sun, and the sun is illuminating, no doubt, the darkness. And this is a consistent metaphor of, of who Jesus is, that, that Jesus, he is the light of the world. And that, that rising from the dead, he dispels the darkness of death and sin and of Satan. And, and the sun is really reminding us of the manifest presence of God in our life. That, that manifest presence means that God is showing it, that, 
uh, that, that it's, it's available, that it is, we're aware of it. It's not just, well, he's here, but we don't know he's here. It's, we, we're very much aware of the manifest presence of God, that he's manifested himself in our hearts and in our minds. And this is what he's alluding to, that there is a day coming with his son, and he is a son of righteousness, a son of righteousness. And, and as this son rises, and he is righteous, and as we think about Jesus, and we think about the grace of God, and we think about the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is not devoid from or divorced from righteousness. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that that, that, that the, it's the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then the very next verse says, for in it, the gospel, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, that, that it is the righteousness of God is the gospel. The good news is that we don't continue to live in sin and live in wickedness with a wicked heart. The gospel transforms us. The, tri- the gospel imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to us. What is not normal and natural for us, we get by the imputating work of Christ on the cross that he gives us his righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin, didn't become a sinner, but he became sin so that we might through him become the righteousness of God, that we might have the righteousness of God. And so he is the son of righteousness. And it reminds us of the Holy Spirit who comes to convict us of sin and judgment and righteousness. And it is the work of God, it is the work of the gospel. Jesus and his grace and gospel, they, they are consistent with the righteousness of God. You see, the grace of God is not just overlooking sin and sweeping it under the carpet. No, it is dealing with sin and dying on the cross for our sin so that we can be liberated from our sin. Not just the penalty of our sin, of not going to hell, but also the power of sin so that we don't have to continue to live in sin. That God gives us ultimate victory. Certainly that will be in glorification. Certainly it will be in heaven. But certainly God is giving us steps and grace by grace and steps of grace along the way to allow us to, to grow in sanctification and progress in, in our walk with Christ, become more like him. And But also this sun, if you'll notice, it is rising <laughs> And boy, doesn't that remind us of Jesus, one who rose from the dead and Jesus Christ himself rising. And it gives us a picture of of Jesus. He rose from the dead. And I'm telling you, his, his light has been rising in dark places ever since. And his sonship and the light of the gospel is rising across northwest Arkansas. And it's rising across this globe among unengaged, unreached people groups all over the world till the glory of God one day will, will fill the earth, the Bible says. Habakkuk prophesied and saw that also one day, that, that this sun is rising. And as you see that sun rise in the morning, now some of y'all don't ever see that, but, but when you do, those who do, you see that sun rising, man, you, you just see that, the, 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 the light breaking across the plain, and, and you see it just peeking up, and, and then how it just begins to spread, and, and the next thing you know, the, the sun is high in the sky, and, 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 and everything, all the darkness is exposed at that point in time, and that is a beautiful picture that we have because this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and not until then will the end come. It's what Jesus told us. But also this sun is rising and it is described further with healing in its wings. With healing in its wings and, and that idea of the sun in, in, in ancient writing that that sun is often pictured as it, it begins to, to spread out that it, it has the, the, the picture the, the, the mind the, the, the word picture of of wings uh, as those rays of light spread out and, and in those wings are healing and certainly Jesus brings great comfort and warmth and he provides physical healing and and emotional healing and spiritual healing. And then we continue in verse 2, and he says, And you will go forth and skip about like calves 
from the stall. Uh, and, and he goes on in verse 3, You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. This is a picture of freedom, a picture of exuberance and joy and, and, and youthful and unreserved and obvious expression of abandonment. You know, when that, you let that calf, you see, now you get a big old, big old milk cow, I'm not going to take off running too, too much, but well, you see those little cows, a little, little calf, and, uh, and, and, and sometimes you just see them just running, you know, and, and it, it's so distinguishable because it's such a contrast to the, to the full-grown cows, but you let that, that calf out of the stall, and I think, man, he, he's going to take off running and because uh, it's been locked up, and, and there's freedom there, and, uh, and, and it's just jumping around and having, and, and that is the picture that, that when we get the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, that, that, that we will be like that new calf that's let out of the gate, running around, joyful exuberance. And you know, that, that should be an expression that we have in gathered worship especially, and that we should have in our personal life. There should be elements of, of exuberance. Youthful exuberance about what God has done in our life and the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. We've been set free. You know, the devil and, and, and the world and our flesh wants to tell us that we're free when we can sin. We can do whatever we want to. That's what uh, people grow up and they think, man, I can't wait till I can get out from under, you know, this authority so that I can go and do what I want to do. And, and really what they're saying is so I can go out and sin and live a sinful life. And, 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 and then they're blinded to not know that they're really in bondage. Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's why he comes and he, he holds people in bondage. But the real freedom is in Jesus. Being surrendered to him and under his authority and the authority of the word of God. That's where freedom is. And that's where joy comes. And in freedom, Jesus came to set the captive free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Satan is a liar and he's a deceiver. And he wants to, to, to destroy your life. But Jesus came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. In verse 4 it says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. There's a very familiar command throughout Scripture is remember. And we need to be told to remember because we tend to forget. <laughs> and we need to be reminded over and over again. And, uh, you know, it reminds me of the guy that, uh, the pastor who preached the same exact sermon every Sunday night. Every Sunday night. And so finally, said, why are you preaching that same sermon every single Sunday night? He said, well, are you doing everything that is in that sermon? He said, well, no, not yet. So, well, then, then I'm going to keep on preaching it. And we need to be reminded because we tend to forget. And here God is reminding these people remember the law of Moses, my servant. An unusual <clears throat> uh, statement, that, that exact phrase is not anywhere else in the, in the Bible. But it, it's a, the law of Moses for those people in that day. They were remembering the word of God. And there was a connectedness to the word of God and the warning of judgment that is coming. There was a connectedness to the word of God of the promise of hope that is on the way. And so there is an, an ethical connection on how a person should live, and then there's an eschatological uh, perspective on what, how we should hope. And, and we find all of that in the Word of God. And so our message, our encouragement, our hope is found in the Word of God. It is the Word of God that tells us about the Son of God. It is the Word of God that was inspired by the Spirit of God. And so to walk with the Son of God and to be filled with the Spirit of God, it is a necessity for us to be connected to the Word of God. And so, and then we see not only that, but we see that it will be a day of, rest, of a restoring prophet. So a restoring prophet. Look at verse 5. It says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And, and, and this is a, a prophetic word about a prophet. And who is Elijah? That's always the question. And obviously that as we look into the New Testament and we see that John the Baptist is an Elijah that is mentioned. Uh, Jesus said, Elijah's already came and you didn't receive him, you killed him. And, uh, and, and he was talking about John the Baptist. 
But then Jesus also said, Elijah will restore, he will restore, and that did not happen. And so certainly John the Baptist was an Elijah. Elijah's mentioned 28 times in the New Testament. And we also know that on the Mount of Transfiguration that Jesus was there with Moses and Elijah. And we also know that many believe the Revelation chapter 11 passage where the two witnesses are that of Moses and Elijah. But ultimately, the fulfillment of this prophecy is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we see is that God sends Elijah. Now, Elijah had, was already dead, or actually Elijah had already gone up to, to heaven uh, by the time this was written in Malachi. And so he was certainly looking at an Elijah type. And, and, and God has always had a messenger. God always sends a messenger. And, you know, in, in our study on the, the entire Bible, we call epic story, and the little track that we've written that, that talks about that, it says, then, then God, you know, God spoke to, uh, you know, gave a promise to, to Abraham. He, he had delivered Noah, gave a promise to Abraham, and then God sent prophets to speak of the Messiah, and then God himself came. Jesus came. And then we know that Jesus will come again. And the ultimate fulfillment of this passage is in the return of Jesus. That Jesus, that God always has a messenger, and, and we serve as, as some type of a John the Baptist, some type of an Elijah, preparing the way for the Lord. We prepare the way for other people to receive the Lord. We're preparing the way for the second coming of Christ now. But there is one coming who will restore. And we see that in this passage of Scripture. In verse 6, it says, He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. And, and I want you to notice, first of all, that He will restore. That the fathers will not restore their own hearts. To their children, and the children will not restore their own hearts to their fathers, but he will do it. And so the only one who can do that is Jesus. He's the only one. He's the only hope. He's the only hope for your family, my friend. He's the only hope for your life. He, he's the only one who can do it. No one else can do it. But what is it that he does? Well, he will restore. He will turn their hearts and turning is, an, is repentance. Re turning is, is changing, that, that things have to change. And, and dear friend, part of being a follower of Jesus is wanting to change. Wanting to change, wanting to, to, things to be different. Wanting things to be better. <laughs> wanting to know God more intimately, to, to, to take steps in your sanctification, to, to be transformed from being lost to being saved. It, it, this whole get-together that we have, this gathering, what God has called us to is a calling to change and for Him to change us and Him to restore, first of all, the hearts of the fathers to their children so that a father and a mother, the parents will love their children. And you think that was so basic, but, but it's not as basic as we think. Maybe when they're small, they're a little bit easier. <laughs> they get older and disappointment, being not appreciated, those kinds of things happen and You'd be amazed, maybe you wouldn't be amazed, because some, some of you maybe find yourself in that situation where that's not always the case. But God will change our hearts to love our children, to not ignore them, but appreciate them as gifts. They will long for their children to come home. They will long for their children to be restored, to be secure, to be safe. They will be like the, the father in the story of the prodigal son. They will be anxiously awaiting and looking out over the horizon, anticipating their children to come home. They will be kind. They will not constantly criticize. 
and they will forgive their children. But God will also restore the hearts of the children to their fathers and to their mothers. The children will not be rebellious against the discipline and the authority and the instruction of the parent. They will honor their father and their mother as the Bible tells us to do and promises a long life associated with those who do that. They will respect their father and their mother and heed what Proverbs says over and over again about those who despise their father or mother or bring great grief to their hearts. They will not neglect nor forget their father and their mother. And you see what the promise is in this passage is that from our perspective, we tend to play the victim. We all, we've all been mistreated. I mean, there's not a person here who has not been mistreated. I mean, we all have by somebody. The question is that do we identify with being a victim or do we look to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who was victimized more than anyone who's ever walked on this planet? And do we allow him to fill our life and to restore us? Folks, I want you to know, it, it's no fun being bitter. It's no fun being vengeful. It's no fun being angry. It's, I mean, it, it's a terrible way to live. But what God has promised and the hope that he gives us is that we can forgive. And we can hope. And we can anticipate, and we can look for, and we can long for, and we can, as love, love, love covers a multitude of sin, that, that love thinks the best and, and hopes the best. And that's what God is promising us. He, he begins by telling us, I have loved you. In Malachi 1.5, and here he's saying, listen, I'm going to restore something that Satan has taken away. I'm going to restore something that sin has taken away. I'm going to give you something that, that only I can do. He will restore this. And it's only found in the person and work of Jesus. No one else can do I'm telling you, there's not a counselor on this planet that can do this for you. There's not a medication on this planet that can do this for you. Only Jesus can do this. I'm not against counselors and I'm not against medication. I've, I've gone to a counselor and I have uh, taken medication. I take a little uh, uh, Crestor to keep the, keep the pipes cleared out a little bit. But uh, anyway, so I'm not opposed to that. But I'm telling you what, those cannot do what only Jesus can do. Only he can do that. And that's the promise of Malachi. The prophetic word of Malachi, it's, it's heavy, it's hard, and some would say it's harsh. But I want you to know it's not without hope, and it's not without remedy. For some of us, we've got to be confronted with our sin before we can ever be convinced of our desperate need of a Savior. But the good news is there is a Savior, and He's mighty to save. And His arm is not too short that it cannot save, and it cannot save you today. God can restore your families. God can restore things that you would think never could happen. That's the promise of God. And if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't, pre I wouldn't preach this book. I wouldn't waste my time. I wouldn't waste your time. We would, we would be guilty of those uh, in, in, that we read about at first who just thought this gathering was vain. <laughs> that, that, that it doesn't do any good. My friend, he is a sun rising with healing in his wings. He can restore, and he not only can, but he will restore the hearts of fathers to their children and children to their fathers. Would you bow your head with me in prayer? If you've never trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior, God wants to restore you to himself, the Heavenly Father. And the way that he has chosen to do that is by sending his Son into the world to die on a cross and to be raised from the dead so that we might believe in him. And in believing in him, we might have life everlasting. We might have eternal life to live forever with God, but also to have meaningful life now. If that's what 
God has convicted you and convinced you that you need in your life today. I want to help you do what God's calling you to do. Whether you're watching online or whether you're here in the room, would you pray this prayer with me? Would you say, Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. And I believe that he rose from the dead. I turn away from my sin and I trust in Jesus and him alone for my eternal salvation. I receive this gift that I cannot earn and that I do not deserve. Thank you, Lord, for saving me today. Father, I pray that you'd bless those who are trusting in Jesus today. And Lord, I pray for those that need you to restore their families. Lord, there's a, just a direct connection there. And let us not miss it. Let's not blow past it. God, help us to believe that you can do what you say that you are going to do. It is not that you can just do it, but that you will do it. You will restore for all who are trusting in you. Lord, I pray that we would appropriate the the truth of this message into our lives, that we'd never be the same, that that we would be confronted with our sin and our desperate need of a Savior, but we would also be convinced that you have made a way through your Son And that we would call upon you, that we would call upon you to return us, to restore us, to turn our hearts from a heart of anger and bitterness, a heart of defeat and depression and discouragement. And Lord, we can't do that on our own. And and we're we're so grateful that you made it very clear in this passage that that He will restore. And so, Lord, we ask that You would do that. We want to be a willing, cooperative participant in what You are doing. Lord, give us the, the grace to forgive. Give us the grace to hope. Give us the grace to think the best of. Give us the grace to anticipate a better future. Give us the grace to look forward to a future day, Lord Jesus, that coming day when, yes, it will come and it will be burning like a furnace to the chaff, but it will also be a coming day of reward to those who believe, those who are trusting in you and hoping in you. And Lord, we pray that would be enough and more than enough to see us through this day, these weeks, these months, these years, until Jesus comes back. And until he does, Lord, help us to be faithful to share this message of hope and to preach this gospel of the kingdom in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.